staying healthy, staying sexy, staying young is what living life is all about. And if you have doctors that have proven treatments that keep people young and healthy so they don't get sick, um, you want people to know about these treatments and that they exist. This episode is brought to you by Gainswave. Gainswave is a treatment done at your doctor's office to optimize erection quality without the need of Viagra, Cialis. It's non-surgical, there's no needles, and it has an amazing success rate. To find a Gainswave provider, go to gainswave.com. That's G-A-I-N-S-W-A-V-E.com. This is Mark L. White with Health Hacks, and today we are honored to have Dr. Andrew Hill discussing neurofeedback, and it's going to be very interesting to talk about neurofeedback and with what's going on. Um, this is our post-COVID show, our second post-COVID show, and I think more than ever, people would like to hack their brain because I, I've read yesterday that anti-anxiety medications like Xanax and um, depression medications, prescriptions are up 15%. Yeah, and, and I imagine the same thing is true for things like sleep meds and, you know, alcohol abuse and other things like that. I, I assume, I haven't looked at the data. I mean, there's a huge mental health crisis, a slow moving crisis right now, right? Because the the economic stuff is really rapid and the sort of halting of the economy has been very rapid. But I think we're going to experience another six to, six months to several years of economic fallout with a lot of mental health consequences because of the increased strain and decreased access. I mean, I saw a statistic that admits to ERs for things that aren't COVID are non-existent, basically. People are not going to the doctor for anything they don't, that they don't absolutely have to. Forget mental health, just physical health right now, which means that untreated hypertension and diabetes and you know mild cardiac things are all mounting for people over this time because of essentially their fear. Now, extend that to mental health, how are we are not taking care of our sleep, our stress response, our substance use, you know, and I think you're getting into a potentially large uh, space of us needing to take care of ourselves, you know. Well, I, I think that people, you know, everybody's talking about locking down, shutting down the economy. And of course, we need to take care and protect people who are vulnerable. But um, I, do you think we're underestimating the mental health crisis out there? Like, I don't see that being addressed as much as it should be. I, I think, Mark, we always underestimate mental health needs and crises. Uh, when they're happening to somebody else, they're often invisible or less visible than they are to you, right? I mean, you break your arm, it's kind of obvious, but you break your, your, your threat sensitivity and develop a PTSD, you know, evaluation, rumination mode. I might not know that, you know, or it happens early in life and it breaks your, you know, relational way of feeling safe when, when you're attached to people you're intimate with. That's hard to see from the outside. You can't tell there's an injury you know, or, a, or a, a, some scar tissue or some dysregulation. So I think we always underestimate it. And we uh, are going to discover perhaps, you know, in the, with increased stress sores, just how real some of these needs are for, for, for those of us, you know. Um, thankfully, it's, you know, the, it's 2020 and not like 1980. So commercials on TV are saying things like, you're not alone and we're here for you. There's a lot of, you know, mental health focused or at least sort of soft, you know, uh, focused, emphasis these days on taking care of the intangible, but I think we have to bring it tangible. I mean, it's a lot of what we do with at Peak Brain is we bring the, uh, the brain hacking piece, we make it transparent and demystify it. So I want you to go into a center of ours and look at your brain and say, well, you might be like, why is my shoulder kind of sore? Why is my range of motion or my jump not where I want it to be? And, and treat these things with more of a physiological, you know, demystified perspective, ideally. Um, so, so I think we always underestimate it. So yes, is a short answer, but you know, maybe we have an opportunity with, with all of us experiencing a wider range of stressors perhaps right now to find new ways to take care of ourselves. So you see more also on the, I guess on the positive side, you see more people talking about meditation and, and you saw this coming with the age of social media and the iPhone and our attentions are always pulled elsewhere. What, what do we even know about the brain? Because I think that's something that, you know, like well, we're still figuring it out. In terms of mindfulness and attention and things like that. Um, I mean, we, we, under, we, we don't really understand well how we experience reality. Like the consciousness question is still an open question. But we do understand aspects of how our minds interact with the world, directing our attention. We call it executive function, what you focus on, how you act, how you choose to act. 
or handling stress response. There's certain circuits in the brain for evaluating what's around you or evaluating what you should focus on. And those things can get shifted. If you're in a threat sensitive environment all the time, your brain will develop this evaluation mode and you'll perceive things as potentially more threatening by default, this negativity bias. What we do know is the brain's incredibly changeable all your life, it's always changing. And so if it learns itself, if you will, into a situation where the world's not predictable or safe chronically and you end up in this acute reactive mode, it can also learn itself out of that mode over time with support. It's completely changeable over time. Nothing in your brain is really fixed. Uh, it's among the, it, it's the most changeable part of your, your, brain, your, your body and it's changing rapidly in the course of minutes, it starts to change. Uh, so you have control over it, that's the good news, but it's a little mysterious. But do we have control over our thinking? I mean, it's like sometimes mm -hmm. you get these thoughts and you can't get the thinking yeah. to stop. Yeah, it depends on why. I mean, I, I think sometimes we're having thoughts and sometimes our thoughts are having us, you know, sure. Um, uh, with stress, with perseveration, you know, a perseverative stuff is the mind getting stuck, the attention getting stuck on things that bother you. You, you, you chew on them like a dog with a bone. And perseveration is a cognitive, a mental experience. It often is a visceral, uh, you know, an emotional experience. It's worry, rumination. So perseveration, rumination, stuck mind, stuck, you know, worry, come together. And these are features, natural features. You, you have a circuit in the front middle of the brain that selects what you focus on. When you're deciding what to think, what to have for dinner, or what to, you know, turn left or right when you're driving, it's being used. When you're thinking of that person you're in love with, that this hyper focus, ooh, that person's awesome, it's, it's used. And when there's a song stuck in your head, it's being used. Or you have OCD, it's being used. So if you look at your brain um, at rest and you find the little hot spot, you know, the, the, the cingulate in the front is extra active, you can predict, oh, hey, your anterior cingulate's more active than is typical. You might have one of these brains that is a little perseverative, or maybe it's just a CEO. I can't tell if it's a problem looking at someone's brain. I can tell if it's unusual. So that's where the, the fitness perspective is useful when thinking about brains instead of medical perspectives, because brains are so unusual that you know, just you being weird. I hope you're weird, Mark. I mean, really. Like, We're all weird. Not. Yeah, exactly. And We're all weird. Be, we just like, have to learn how to accept that weirdness and, right. and lean into it. And if it doesn't get in the way of life, you know, productive, active life and living, you know, whatever you want to do, then it's not a pathology. It's just a quirk. It's eccentric, eccentricity, right? So in brain mapping, which is our assessment tool, we look at your brain at rest and then compare it to people your age. And we see how much of different brain waves you have, how fast they are, and if they're running at high or low gears in certain circuits. So I can predict things like, oh, the cingulate in the front is kind of hot for you in beta waves. Do you get songs stuck in your head a lot? Or maybe you're like a high powered CEO, or maybe you're kind of OCD. Oh, I'm, very, know, AD, I'm very ADD. Um, so we would see that um, as high amounts of eyes open theta waves for impulsivity, you can't pump the brakes as reliably, or high amounts of alpha waves, it's hard to shift into gear quite so crisply that we used to call it inattentive ADD. Um, that's an excess of alpha waves, typically 80% of the time, roughly in the brain. If you look at a, 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 a you compared to the average person your age, about 80% of the time I would be, oh, hey, extra alpha eyes open. That might mean attention difficulty. Is that plausible? And if you were like, oh, oh yeah, that, that sounds, sounds right. Then you know where in your physiology the likely bottleneck is, and you can then exercise that resource in a different direction. Okay, so you let's say you map my brain and you say, okay, mm. I know you're weird. I know you don't sleep well. Sometimes you think too much about the future or the past and you're very ADD because I saw that in your map. Yeah, what all that would probably show up. How do you change all that? Well, then it's really a function of, um, I mean, there's, there's the technique and then there's sort of metaphor around it. And let me just let me break those apart for a second. Um, the metaphor here is personal training. You do an exercise or two, you see how it feels and you iterate. And it's very, it just builds up and you get really, really strong results as you go and you adjust for the person and you just keep changing things based on the person's needs. That's the general high level piece of it. And you want to exercise your brain about three times a week for half an hour for a few months to make a really big change, huge changes. Now, what you're doing is involuntary operant conditioning, involuntary exercise. You sit in front of the computer and you put a couple of ear clips on and you put one or two wires on top of your head and you measure what your brain is doing on its own. So let's say you're a bit inattentive. Mm -hmm. and with your eyes open, your brain's staying stuck in alpha waves, the neutral frequency. It isn't clicking into beta quite so reliably. So the alpha is a little higher at rest and the beta is a bit lower at rest mm -hmm. than I would want it based on your goals, i.e. crisp visual attention or something. 
So we'll measure your alpha waves moment to moment, your beta waves moment to moment, and whenever on your own, the alpha dips and the beta climbs briefly, the computer will go, good job brain, with more audio and visual feedback. So a car drives faster, or a puzzle piece fills in more squares, or music gets louder. And of course, the next moment your brain varies in the other direction, and the software slows down or stops the game. And the brain's like, hey, 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 wait a minute, that was interesting. And it watches it, and then it happens to move in the right direction. The software goes, good job, brain, good job, brain. And it goes, wait a minute, when I dropped my alpha, stuff happened. And it gets little like applause bursts of that for half an hour. And over the next 24 hours, your brain goes, you know, whenever my alpha dips, stuff happened. That was kind of cool. I like stuff. And it, you have little brief moments of it for the next 24 hours or so as a response to the exercise you did. And your job is to go, I noticed this or didn't notice that. Try it again. And the effects will emerge again. And you tune them. You know, where in the head we're training, which frequencies we're training. It's very iterative, like personal training. But it's this involuntary way of being exercised. It's very kind of non-intuitive that way. And the trick is to sort of say, here's what we should work on based on my maps and my goals. And here's what I noticed in my big features of attention, sleep, stress, mood, creativity, seizures and migraines, ticks, you know, all the things you're working on will, will shift um, subjectively day to day. You could do all of this without, say, cognitive behavioral therapy. You could just, um, using the software, get to your goals. Or For does things it work? that are purely physiological, sure. ADHD is, is physiology, not psychology. Um, we, make, we, we, we do brain mapping every uh, 20 sessions if you're near one of our offices. You can train at home as well, but if you're training in the office, we map you, you know, frequently. And we also measure attention tests on typical neurocognitive CPT batteries. And we do about 40 or 50 sessions for ADHD as a starting place. That's about uh, 50 sessions is four months of training, three times a week. And we typically get about three to four standard deviations on a bell curve. Go wow. from the left of the bell curve by about two to above the bell curve average by about two for the average person with significant ADHD stuff. They walk in low and they have a permanent change to above average within a few months of training. Rapid dramatic changes. Seizure clients drop their seizures by 50% in the literature. And I've never seen a client have a reduction that that poor. It's always been greater. Um, alcohol in literature, the recidivism rate for relapse is reversed. It goes from three quarters down to one quarter in a year with no other interventions added. For PTSD, I give away free services to veterans. They all stop halfway through and they see how much their brains change. They feel so good. They don't want to come to my office anymore because they want to move on with their, with their lives. There's very, very few things you can do to take control of this stuff without having to go through sort of a cognitive experience, this is one of them. And this process was discovered more than 50 years ago on cats. 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 How, do we know what, how do we know how cats think? We don't, but we can measure cats' brainwaves. Huh. So Dr. Sturman in 1967 at UCLA was measuring cats' brainwaves and cats were predator. They make a really obvious brainwave and he was interested in EEG of, of animals. And NASA went to him and said, look, astronauts are getting sick breathing in methyl hydrazine rocket fuel please figure out how dangerous this stuff is and so he did, did a dose dependent study exposing cats to rocket fuel and looking at how it messed with their brains and it caused a very predictable um set of symptoms and it took about an hour before they were having seizures for three quarters of the cats but one quarter of the cats refused to have seizures these super cats i wouldn't show you any symptoms until much much later you know, two and a half hours instead of an hour to show instability events in their behavior. And he couldn't figure out why until he remembered the super cats were used in a previous experiment months before. And what he did was he measured their brain waves. And if you've seen a cat lying on a windowsill, you've seen this brainwave state. It's called sensory motor rhythm, SMR. Predators do it when they're watching prey. Liquid body, but laser-like focus. Yeah, they're just super ADD. <laughs> no, that's the opposite of ADHD. Yeah. It's the exact Hyper opposite. You know, Hyperfocused mind in a still body is the opposite of a disinhibited body in a scattered mind, literally the opposite of ADHD. So Sturman happened to do an experiment. Whenever the cats made more SMR, he squirted chicken broth into their mouth. So it's like training them using like a Pavlov um, response. It's, it's operant. It's Skinner, actually. Yeah, it's not. It's operant conditioning. So it's non-voluntary, you know, ooh, interesting. More stimulus means the thing was good. So he conditioned this SMR up a little bit. And months later, they were seizure resistant. So his lab manager was a seizure-prone, medication-uncontrolled 
epileptic and they built her machine and started doing audio training on her SMR and her seizures reduced. So if somebody's so, not able to go to one of your centers, you have 20 centers, but in this COVID-19 world and in yeah. the Zoom world, can they treat, can you treat people at home? We do a lot of training at home, yeah. We actually have four centers, um, but we, we see clients maybe in 20 countries or something. You know? Wow. Um, but uh, I would say m more than half of my clients, even in 2019, train from home. So this is not a, a COVID thing particularly for us to train you this way. We just send you brain mapping equipment. And uh, here's a little EEG amplifier I happen to have on my desk. We send you a little EEG amplifier for so doing cool. uh, recording. Here's the brain mapping gear. It's a cap you put on your head. You squirt it full of gel. And then you plug it into this thing and we, we run the data collection for you. Teach you how to stick wires to your head and then have a shared log of uh, what you're doing and your results that we work off of together. And we have a live, uh, we, we use the application Slack to do live support. So all of our clients have a dedicated Slack channel with our senior team, uh, coaching and helping get set, helping get set up and you know, address results and things like that. So it works pretty well. It works about as well as it does in the office, which is you know, fairly well for, the, for a lot of things. I thought, too, this is something I tried as, as I got this electrical stimulant device with like a headband, okay. like a um, Fisher or something or other. Mm. And I, I Fisher meditate, Wallace, yeah. Fisher Wallace, I meditate yeah. 20 minutes with that on and I feel so calm and peaceful afterward. Is that the same thing? But this is, a, you know, under medical supervision and a lot. Uh, it's a different technique. Um, you were, uh, my, uh, CES, cranial electrostim, is a category. Fisher Wallace is one example. A better known example is the alpha stim device. Yes. And they simply do a, um, a waveform, an electrical waveform through the head. It's a certain frequency and it's known to be calming and it causes something to happen. We don't fully understand it. In my experience, CES devices work somewhat well for some people with anxiety, but for others, they don't work well at all. It's a one-shot kind of tool and it can do some things, but I don't love CES devices. Neurofeedback, biofeedback on the brain, what we're doing is teaching your brain to change itself. Watching what the brain's doing going, yeah, yeah, more of that. Ooh, more of that. And the brain over time builds its own resources. So you change into a new set of you know, brain resources over a few weeks. Um, even things that aren't uh, aggressively stimulating like CES devices, they tend to have transient results, like TMS used for depression is, is another example of stimulation. You know, it, TMS works for about two thirds of people. I don't think CES when it's Alpha Stam or Fisher Wallace works for two thirds. It might, but I, I think it's worse than that. And TMS, which is a very robust effect for depression, uh, you know, magnetic stimulation is about two thirds uh, efficacious for people. And you do like a whole bunch of sessions of TMS therapy. And then in the, in the, in the sort of eye of the storm you've created, you restructure your life and get some therapy and maybe get some meds and figure out some things because it's going to wear off. You get a month, month and a half, two months, and, and the TMS effect kind of wears off. Anything stimulated generally wears off and often wears off quickly. And I don't think the human brain tends to pick up patterns very well. So I don't believe in binaural beats and listening to sounds and all that stuff is pretty much nonsense. You know, flashing lights and sounds are pretty much nonsense unless they are only flashing and making sound in response to what your actual brain is doing. And then it's training you or teaching you. But things that actually just that send patterns in, the brain is really good at ignoring most of that stuff. When it's electrical, it's being pushed around. Or magnetic, it's being pushed around. You're causing tissue changes, slight ones. But they're, they're not very dramatic, unfortunately. So when you, when you train your brain using pink brain, or when you re, um, mm. use the neurofeedback, the results are pretty much because the brain's changed. They're, you don't have to keep going back after you've done your three months. For the things you're doing every day, attending, suppressing a seizure state, sleeping, waking up, having good emotional resilience, handling stressors, yeah, once you practice the new states, it's like having some weakness in your legs, but going to the, to the occupational therapist, getting really strong and having your daily life habit, including walking. Your legs stay really strong. Your habits become sitting on the couch drinking you know, soda, your legs fall apart again. So if you have a stress response, some trauma, some OCD, some you know, massive ADHD, and you now have a really great brain that's under your control and you use it that way and you continue to use it, it gets more and more stable and more and more performant. But 10, 20 years from now, you get dehydrated, stop sleeping well, pick up alcohol a little too much and pick up your third job. And you may discover the way in which your brain frays is the same way you used to have problems. I had profound ADHD until age 27 or eight and got rid of it in about 18 sessions of neurofeedback, rapid results, 
working after hours in an autism center where, where I was employed actually playing with neurofeedback and got such a dramatic effect myself and I went back and got a PhD. And toward the end of that program, working full time in school full time, stressed out, having some morphous, you know, solution in the future that was called a PhD, but you know, not be able to see it from where I was four years into it or something, soul crushing. It's, it's actually part of the process to having your soul crushed at that point in time. You know, what what came up for me was ADHD like phenomena. But I got through those first three or four years of neuroanatomy and calculus and all the crazy learning that I had to do that I wouldn't have been able to do without taking care of my executive function. And even now, you can probably tell I'm kind of high energy, slightly hyperactive. It's, it's good high energy, though. There's I nothing... appreciate that. More importantly, I can change it on a dime. And the ADHD me, you know, 30 years ago, could not control my regulatory state. And this is true of ADHD. Classically, the ADHD person can sit and play video games all day long, but can't sit in the classroom for five minutes. It's, it, uh, you know, it's only if you're interested in something that you, you get hyper-focused. Or high stimulus. It can, be, it can be dangerous too. And this is why ADHD kids train their parents to fight with them because the low valence, the low stimulus environments are not that exciting. But if you're being yelled at for taking the trash out for the fifth time that day, that activated state lights the frontal lobe and creates the same engagement that a high stimulus or chaotic environment would do like a video game or you know, being a fighter or a sports person or something. It's that high engagement, crisp state. So neurofeedback will teach you to take control over the states. It won't rob you of the state. Take a stimulant or a, a beta blocker, it'll shift you pretty strongly into one mode or another, and then it'll be there until it wears off. You train your brain with neurofeedback and you can now move back and forth between the ranges instead of being stuck in a hunter or a gatherer mode as someone who's ADHD. So, so with this device, you, you buy the device, you keep yeah. the device, you use yeah. the software, three months are up, you continue to do it. Like if you're getting good results or you just don't, you put it away in the closet. Yeah, the way that we set it up, we have a four month coaching program. So we're, we're teaching you all the stuff you need and we set you up with clinical software that our, all of our offices use and it has a year license. So FDA uh, controlled software, it can't be out of there. You know, they can't have open-ended medical software licenses and things. So we, uh, we provided one year license from the vendor for this medical software and we teach you to use it. And we do the first four months to usually address most of your big needs. And then toward the end of that time, we can set up like a peak performance strategy or long-term training strategy. So you can keep, you know, chasing other stuff. Cause this is not about fixing your problems, it's about giving you the resources and the regulation you want. And sometimes you come in with seizures or migraines or OCD or something else. Other times, you know, you're just kind of out of shape. Everyone is not sleeping well enough reacts too much to stress, gets stuck on things, gets burnt out in the afternoons, slows down. The, everyone's chronically sleep deprived in this country pretty much. In the, in the 90s, all the EEG measures on the brain could predict ADHD almost perfectly, like 94% accurate. The exact same studies done now, it's down to like 50% accuracy. Why is that? The sleep deprivation is clouding the population broadly and hiding the things that used to only show up in ADHD. Now they're chronically true of most people, high amounts of slow brain waves, you know, alphas and del deltas and betas when you're awake. That didn't, didn't used to be everybody, only people with ADHD. Well, also in the 1990s, we didn't have this device. Um, yeah, but that doesn't affect like, your, I mean, your ADHD is not a function of your environment. You know, it's how you're built. You're, it, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a pathology. You didn't acquire it. You can get executive function issues through head injury or drug abuse or other things. Sure. But you, but for most of us with an ADHD kind of pattern, it's just a normal human pattern that doesn't exactly fit into everyone else. And all that uh, cell phones and computers teach us to do is to have shorter attention spans behaviorally, you know, to, to, to chunk information quickly. But you could still learn to sit and read for 30 minutes at a time if you needed to. There's nothing getting in the way of that. I mean, and, you know, that isn't a function of, of modern life per se. We just... You know, we take in a lot more information, modern humans, than the humans of the 70s and 80s, you know, uh, uh, bell-bottom humans, you know, they took in much less information every single day. We take in more stuff by 9 a.m. or bits of information uh, on media than most people took in the 70s all day long, you know? So that's, that's the impact, the socialization, the messaging, the, you know, the, the stuff that reflects back in our identity that makes us think we aren't fit enough or tall enough or have enough hair or whatever else, you know? That's the stuff we should be concerned about in terms of information flow, not is it distracting us 
It's because the, yeah, but no more than anything else. So besides um, besides using neurofeedback, I know that you you know a lot about different nootropics. You see Adderall being prescribed at a crazy rate. Yeah. Um, what nootropics should people be on? What kind of nutrition should we be on? Is is Adderall good or bad? Adderall is probably fine if you have significant and severe ADHD. You know, Adderall doesn't seem to have any dramatic downsides when it's used in that narrow context. And some other earlier drugs, Ritalin appears to be neuroprotective. You know, Adderall is not neuroprotective. It's basically methamphetamine done at very, very low dose. But amphetamine is not necessarily all that dramatically dangerous to the brain at low dose in some people that have altered, you know, dopamine, if you will, attention metabolism. You know, it's probably a use case for it. But I think what we call ADHD, meaning, again, we alluded to this earlier, things are only a pathology if they get in the way. They're not a problem if they don't get in the way in, in culture and in life and whatever else. So we call something ADHD if it's annoying to your parent, your teacher, your kid, you know, whatever. It, it, oh, it's ADHD, right? So Every parent has an ADHD kid then. <laughs> sooner or later, right, exactly. But, you know, it's probably something like 8% of the population. And I would have, you know, it's probably several times that percentage in terms of who are prescribed stimulant medication for attention difficulty. And I think sleep issues, just like the, the brain looks like a sleepy issue, that can produce attention problems and get misdiagnosed. Trauma, anxiety, um, brain injuries, they can all look just like ADHD. You know, kids are getting cussed left and right, especially girls in girls' soccer concussed left and right. I see so many brain injuries, mild ones. Half the people I talk to, look at them, half of them, there's mild injuries. You know, just wear and tear. And, and I think that the, the a go-to, like in the you know, 60s and 50s with mother's little helper, you know, little dexedrine, volume, diet little, pills and things yeah. to like keep you uh, up. Now it's Adderall as a lifestyle drug in children and in executives, it's modafinil. You know, also should not be used the way it's used largely. Um, these are not, these are, these are drugs that are somewhat easy to abuse, but have very low, you know, risk profiles generally. So we haven't caught up to the fact that they're causing the same kind of problems. That, I mean, if they cause the same death that opiates caused, we would be talking a lot more loudly about how Adderall is being overprescribed. You know, all it does is rob kids of agency. So they get symptoms suppressed of being distractible with no sense of how to control themselves. Yeah. They, they can't learn how to use ADHD to their benefit. Some studies on that showing that in medication, there's no change 10 years later. It actually, medicated or unmedicated, they still have the, the same poor issues with socioeconomic status and getting through education later. If you have CBT therapy or educational therapy or coaching or neurofeedback or something else alongside medication, the person changes into a new person with new skills. If you just medicate, you rob them of agency and 10 years later, they're not any more effective at being intellectual or academic. So, so Pete Brain has a, a, I think you mentioned a 95% eff um, effective rate. Uh, well, we uh, can move your brain. Sure. Move your brain. Brain, about, brains aren't hard to move. You know, it works for depression too? Through your goals. Yeah. Works well for depression as well? It, it does. Um, depression has some caveats though, because depression is not necessarily a brain resource. Like if you have a, even very specific flavors of anxiety, you can often see it almost like a cramped muscle. You know, you hurt your lower back, the rectal muscles spasm mm -hmm. up and they're really hurting. They're very strong though, right? That's what happens to the posterior cingulate when you get, you get injured by acute stress, acute danger. You're then evaluating in a PTSD mode. It's like the posterior cingulate cramps up to protect you. It's really strongly active. That kind of stuff, really easy to work on. But depression doesn't show up as a depression feature. It's a, depre it's a mood module. So there's like a handful of EEG things that could show up in depression, slowed processing speed. Um, that can also show up in all kinds of other things, uh, left to right frontal asymmetry in alpha, reverse frontal lobe, that can just be you. So depression is one of these things where I'm like never quite sure if what I'm seeing is depression in the brain, but if you work the brain out, you usually get lifts in depression. I'm also not a psychologist, so I tend to work on the brain from a, a fitness perspective. If you walk in saying you're depressed, I'll say things like, well, how depressed are you? Oh, you have some suicidal ideation. Well, you started to hear that. With that history, we should really have a psychologist or a therapist in the mix for you, sir, because I'm not, you know, a good support system. I don't have the skills or that professional role for you. So who else are we working with so we can really work the resources out of your brain while you might work out the mood stuff, the trauma, whatever the deeper stuff is, because you can absolutely push your brain around. 
But this is not just about your brain anymore. If it's depression or severe trauma, now there's an accommodation in your life. There's probably some mm. other stuff. It may be serving some, especially with anxiety, can serving some, some purpose. You know, so if you squash it, you can get weird results. So th there's a role for cognitive stuff and for therapy or meditation or a guru or a priest or, you know, a thousand other ways to deal with the psychological. And I, I sort of feel like once the physiological, which is so mysterious to people, is out of the way, they will, they're, they're, they're used to trying to control your mind. You're not used to trying to control your brain. So the, the joke is, if I take you out of a VW Bug and put you in a Tesla, your driving will change. You'll, you'll figure it out. So I don't feel I need to intervene from a psychological context unless someone's got acute psychological uh, needs. And then I'm just part of the team or Peak Brain's just part of the team. So talking about controlling a brain, what, what do you think about where we're going with this and what Elon Musk is doing? I think he's doing what, Neuralink? And um, I call it the wizard hat. I don't love what he's doing. Um, I think Elon Musk is simply, it's all, it's all sizzle no steak here. Um, he's created a, a project. He's poured some money and some brains into a project to try to do BCI, brain computer interface. But there are some fundamental problems in, in, in uh, measuring the brains that have never been solved and that he has there's no indication that he has any plans to solve. And the statements he's making about what his system's gonna do make me think he doesn't really understand the brain or brain interfaces that much at all. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's speaking mostly sci-fi. I mean, really, he really is. There's very, very little we can do reliably these days with brain computer interface. And it will be that way for quite some time, for decades. But there are technological hurdles that yet have to be solved. We it's interesting really though, I guess the way he sees it, which is, it's interesting is like our, our brain is, is basically zeros and ones and binary. And if you yeah. can control those with electrical stimulants, then you can act a certain way or be a certain way. But we don't know how those zeros and ones are encoded. Like even something as simple as memory. Carl Lashley, the father of psychology, tried to figure out where memory was. He trained mice to, to run in, in, in mazes and then started cutting chunks of their brain out. He never got mice to not run the mazes, even with most of their brain removed. Wow. Couldn't figure out where the heck is memory. And now we know memory's not anywhere. Well, it may be. There's actually four or five different places it probably is, and then it's everywhere. What I mean by that is the synapse between neurons, and they send little receptors out to make the, 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 the synapse signaling more sensitive or less sensitive to chemicals. And the pattern of where receptors used to be, the holes in the end of the neuron, appears to be a memory trace. But neurons making connections or not making connections is the primary sec uh, memory. It's a mathematical sort of a, a, a association made. It turns out it's not probably a single neuron as a one or a zero, that bit. It's probably not a single neuron. It's probably a so. mathematical assor assortment of the neurons as an equation. And once it's created, the equation can then be written throughout the brain anywhere. It's a hologram. Any piece of memory potentially within the brain can recreate all memory. If you can, if you can get the, 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 uh, the mathematical algorithm tight enough, memories are actually echoing in a distributed fashion throughout the brain, not, not discreetly done. So where are you going to plug that wire in to, to make things change? We don't understand the brain well enough, period. Yeah. And, and memories are usually, people don't even talk about it, but memories are usually wrong. I mean, they are. Most you know, are people, people are convinced they saw that person with a blue shirt and you go back, no, nope, that person had a red shirt. Like, memories are, are, are constructed, which is good and bad. It's bad because we don't know what is real, but it's good because you can reframe your experiences of things. That's what therapy is. You experience trauma or difficulty in a safe context, and the act of remembering things physiologically is very similar to the act of first storing memories. So it's kind of like when you think about stuff with a therapist, take it off the shelf in a safe room, <laughs> look at the scary thing, you know, put it back on the shelf, but you change the context because of where and how you've recontextualized the memory. And this can, I mean, for exposure therapy, this is the number one thing that's useful in trauma and obsessions. If you can tolerate exposure therapy, and people can't, you know, half people who do exposure therapy drop out. But if you can tolerate exposure therapy, it's profoundly impactful and works to help you not have phobias or anything else because it just forces the brain to learn. So, you know, a lot of my work is helping people understand where their brain might not be doing the things they want to do and helping them find the levers, levers for stress response, levers for metabolic change, for sleep change, 
some of that's neurofeedback, but as you were saying, there's mindfulness, there's nootropics, there's nutrition, there's all kinds of things. I kind of didn't mention the, I, I didn't, I didn't answer the nootropic question. Um, that's a very broad uh, landscape and I do, I no longer really recommend particular nootropics as a, as a broad category. I'll say nutritionally, most of us should be doing vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids. Um, guys, you know, your, your age and mine probably also need to be doing things like pregnenolone, you know, especially if you're a high powered stressed out dude, you know, in our, in, in our forties and fifties, um, we're going to start shunting cortisol or, uh, pregnenolone into cortisol instead of into testosterone, uh, for people like you and I. So we need to boost preg and that'll get our T back high and keep us young mm -hmm. for years. Um, but the one big biohack just to give people something very, very actionable. We mentioned how profoundly well rested most of the country is um, the number one control you have for circadian rhythm for when you think it's awake or, or a day in life, uh, it's day and night rather. The number one lever, number one button you can push is when you eat. It's bigger than light, bigger than activity, bigger than when you sleep, when you eat. Um, so the number one thing people are doing wrong generally is eating before bed. You gotta let yourself fast for three to four hours before bed to let insulin drop especially if you're north of 30 years old, because the only growth hormone you're getting is after you fall asleep, right then in one big pulse. But if you have any insulin in your system, there's no growth hormone released. So no insulin growth pulse. factor. That's, I've yeah. never heard that before. That's an interesting biohack. Um, so you have to really back your food away from your bedtime by a few hours for almost everyone. And Americans are horrible at doing this. We stay up late snacking. We're horrible eaters, America. That too, yeah. But if you, do, if you can, you know, I don't care what you eat to some extent, if you push it away from your bedtime, it'll almost always improve your bed, your sleep. This, this is fascinating. I, I could probably ask you about three more hours of questions, which I'm not going to do, but I, I want to ask you about, like, I just turned 50. Mm -hmm. and, um, what do we do about it? Yeah, it, you know, I still feel sharp, but how you do should. you... You should. 50 is young. You shouldn't have any age-related cognitive decline at all until uh, 60s, at all, at all, until mid-60s. Well, can neurofeedback though reverse aging the aging brain? Can it, the park or um, Alzheimer's, any of that? Have you seen any good responses there? Um, it can help with general aging, speed of processing a lot, sleep regulation a lot. Um, it also boosts plasticity broadly. So there's this youngening fact that happens as you train the brain, you start to develop like, you'll wake up and have dreams. Uh, well, you want to go back to sleep and find out what happens next in the morning, like those teenager dreams. I'm gonna, wow, that was cool, that was a cool story. That'll start happening again as you do neurofeedback. The brain will shift down. And yes, I've worked on things like stroke damage and Parkinson's a fair amount with some good success. Um, dementias though, especially Alzheimer's type dementias are a lot of tissue damage. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, you may be able to reduce the decline, but you're not gonna really be a primary intervention. With Alzheimer's I would, or dementias in general, I would have somebody go after the metabolic routes and have them do like a Brzezetin you know, recode or men program, functional medicine to find, because to find the 37 or 38 factors that cause the brain to degrade, you can address these things metabolically at this point. And Brzezetin's taking people that are, uh, you know, three quarters of the hippocampus is gone and their memory centers and he's addressing lifestyle factors. Hippocampus is regrowing and they're leaving memory units. So for severe dementia, I would say it's a metabolic intervention. For someone like you, who's clearly sharp, as long as you don't screw with your blood sugar too much, you're gonna be fine. Because there's no way to get Alzheimer's type dementias in mid years, unless it's genetic, unless you have the presenilin genes. And then you know, because people in your family fall apart at your age, like seriously fall apart at 50. And if that isn't true, then it's a metabolic process, type three diabetes, if you will. You know, or in the case of Parkinson's dementias, it's glycation of tissue through advanced, or Lewy body dementia, it's, it's, it's rusting of tissue through advanced sugars. But control your sugar, do some intermittent fasting, do some paleo or keto diets, look at your inflammatory factors, look at your testosterone, you know, look at these recode programs and find the metabolic factors and find your favorite medical, uh, functional medicine doc and have them do the screen, figure out if you, you know, your homocysteine is too high, your T is too low and adjust those things. And the brain probably won't shrink. You know, um, the recode guys say that it, the brain flips into the synapto clastic mode where it consumes the brain tissue versus an aptoblastic mode where it builds brain tissue, just like the osteoclasts and osteoblasts in our bones are in regulatory balance and then get thrown off by hormonal stuff or stress and the bones fall apart. Same thing happens with brain tissue, it looks like. So you can address it metabolically, you know, it seems. 
So if somebody wanted to get on, uh, if they wanted to have their brain mapped, and I want to have my brain mapped, by the way, and I, mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about that because I'm fascinated about what's going on up there. It's, uh, I'm, I'm a curious one, but how do they find you? Like, where do they go? So Peak Brain uh, has main offices in Los Angeles and St. Louis in the U.S. and a couple uh, in Europe. And um, St. Louis, Peak interest, Brain. interesting choice. Yeah, we we have a we have got a lot of referrals suddenly in St. Louis because we helped. Uh, we we were a lot of people that don't fit diagnostic criteria, and everyone's frustrated. You know, especially a lot of kids who are like in their teens that are being kicked out of school after school after school, and nobody can help them because they're not really autistic, and they're not really ADHD, and they're not really oppositional. They're just miserable and, you know, having catastrophe after catastrophe. And we work with these kids day in, day out and resolve things rapidly. We did this and we started getting all these referrals from St. Louis. It's so awesome. We had, we had open office there. Um, you can come to one of the offices and get mapped, of course. Um, listeners to your show get a half price uh, entry fee. So it's only $249 instead of $500 bucks for the brain maps. And then it's free repeats. We're kind of weird in that we provide open access to data forever for you. So you can come back and get mapped you know, frequently, but um, we can also send you equipment and do remote training programs and uh, people can check us out at peakbraininstitute.com. There's a remote trainer program at peakbrain.info, which is a separate website. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, you can check us out all of our social media at peakbrainla. So you can check out, you know, follow us on social media, tell us your brain, cool brain things. Um, and uh, we're on Facebook with a group, you know, we're, we're easy enough to find. So well, that's it. If you want to get your brain mapped right. and then trained, that's right. Peakbrain.com. Peakbraininstitute.com. Peak brain Peak We're going to have this in the show notes. We'll have all the, the big, anything you need to know about the show. And if you're listening to the show and you uh, mention that, you get 50% off. That's very generous of you, Dr. Hill. Well, we try to make the, the barrier to entry to understanding your own brain extremely low. I mean, most people charge over a grand for a brain map every time because they're psychologists writing reports for you. It's their clinical decision-making. It's a very deep process. We don't do that. I, I will sit and teach you to read your brain map. And then if you want to pop in every six to 12 months for more data gathering, you should. It's your brain. You know, it's like your gym. I, you, know, you belong to a high-end gym. Maybe you pop in once a, a year for your DEXA scan. You get your, yeah, you get your body comp yeah, done. Yeah, I mean, like Equinox, if you're a member, we'll be happy to get you come in once a, once a year and, and tell you all the things you should change. You know, if you want to start working on your body again or something, we do the same thing for your brain. But it's kind of open-ended because people do all kinds of things with their brain. So it's much more, you know, bespoke, basically. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your time, doctor. And I, I, I want to get my brain mapped and then I want you to come back onto the show and I can, I can tell you what I've uh, found. We well, might be able to work that out. Sounds good, doctor. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks, you too. Take care.